Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Michael Wall. Thank you so much for joining me for this concise and I hope informative and practical discussion on methylene blue and cancer. Again, my name is Dr. Michael Wald. I've been practicing holistic health care for over 30 years, originally as a chiropractor. I went to medical school just for fun. I don't practice medicine. I have a board certification in nutrition, a master's degree. I'm a dietitian, and I am a sports nutritionist. So let's get into this topic. To begin with, we'll start with a disclaimer. Um, this information is for your educational purposes only. It's not intended as a substitute for sound medical or nutritional health advice, so please be careful. So let's begin first talking about what methylene blue is and its anti-cancer potential. First of all, it's used in medicine as a photosensitizer, which means it can, it's combined with other compounds in cancer care and it enhances the efficacy of the cancer care. It also has historically been used as an anti-malarial drug and also to treat a condition known as methemoglobinemia, which is a condition where the oxygen molecule does not detach easily from the hemoglobin molecule. And that obviously is a problem that creates a anaerobic or oxygen poor environment and cancer cells love oxygen poor environments. So let's talk about some more details about how methylene blue actually works. First of all, it's effective against several different cancers, including colorectal cancer, melanomas, and carcinomas in preclinical models. And one of its mechanisms of action, how it works in the body, is it induces cell death in cancer cells and it spares healthy cells. How convenient is that? And the studies that have been done so far show some very promising outcomes. For example, Methylene blue's been shown to reduce tumor size and slow progression in resistant ovarian cancer, a type of cancer that has a very high mortality. And some of the risks are that it may induce what's known as serotonin syndrome. That's where serotonin levels in the body are too high. So it's important to make sure that any medications or nutritional supplements that you're taking will not add to this risk of melatonin syndrome. And some of those nutrients that might do that would include melatonin, for example, uh, tryptophan, uh, GABA, uh, which is called gamma aminobutyric acid. And there are some others. Again, be careful. And then there is the dose range in the studies that range somewhere from 0.04 milligrams per kilogram. And there's no standard uh, dosing, however, it, that depends on the individual, their stage of cancer and other factors. All right, so how exactly does methylene blue affect cancer cells? What are its targets, molecularly speaking? So first of all, methylene blue interferes with cancer cell metabolism by targeting its mitochondrial function. And the mitochondria, as you might remember from seventh grade biology class, is the powerhouse of the cell. It's an organelle, a tiny little organ, you might say, within a cell that produces energy in the form of ATP. And uh, methylene blue interferes with cancer cells' production of ATP. That's a good thing. Also, methylene blue increases what are known as reactive oxygen species, which break down cancer cells. Cancer cells also rely heavily on a physiologic process in the body known as glycolysis. And by interfering with glycolysis and mitochondri mitochondrial energy production, uh, cancer cells are much more um, susceptible to successful cancer therapies. Methylene blue also disrupts what's known as the electron transport chain, another energy producing pathway in the body, which would result in depletion of energy in cancer cells. And again, this part is really important. Healthy cells are less affected due to their lower reliance on glycolysis and better antioxidant defenses, making methylene blue selectively toxic to cancer cells. Any conversation about a medication would be incomplete unless we also spoke about nutritional interactions, both foods and nutritional supplements. I'll give you a positive or synergistic reaction uh, with methylene blue and a nutrient, and that nutrient would be vitamin C. However, intravenous vitamin C acts as a pro-oxidant. I'll say that again, vitamin C intravenously does not act as an antioxidant, which is what we've been taught is a good thing. 
but still, but but then again, it acts as an oxidant. So if you want combined synergistic effects of oxidation, which we know kills cancer cells, combining methylene blue with vitamin C may be appropriate. But there are reasons why some people should not take vitamin C or methylene blue, uh, for that for that matter. Now, vitamin C acts synergistically with methylene blue, as I just mentioned, due to increased oxidative stress. That's intravenously. Oral vitamin C almost always works as an oxidant, or I should say an antioxidant. And there are laboratory tests, which you can run on a, on a patient, that will tell you whether or not their overall state of metabolism is oxidative or antioxidative. And then there's coenzyme Q10. That's another popular nutrient used for heart disease and neuropathies and, and many other conditions, but it supports mitochondrial function in healthy cells. So by using methylene blue, you can help protect and shore up those healthy cells against oxidative stress produced by methylene blue, which would then uh, kill cancer cells through oxidative mechanisms. And um, vitamin B6, B12, and folic acid are extremely important for detoxification pathways, and they aid in metabolism and clearance of methylene blue from the body. So when it's time to get this stuff out of the body so it doesn't continue to promote oxidative stress and wear down the healthy cell's ability to maintain their antioxidant potential against methylene blue, we may want to use B6 B12 or folic acid, and we want to use the activated forms of those nutrients. Fiber also is very important for eliminating oxidative products once you're done with methylene blue. And uh, then there are polyphenols. These are plant compounds uh, like green tea and turmeric, and studies have shown that they seem to interfere with reactive oxygen species, so that would reduce the effect of methylene blue. So again, there are many different adverse methylene blue drug nutrient interactions and then there are also several positive synergistic reactions between various nutrients and foods and methylene blue and they are beyond the scope of this talk today so we need to keep in mind that when we're thinking about methylene blue and or the use of nutrition in combination that we want to maintain a holistically minded approach because there are many factors in one's life that will affect how these these uh, various compounds, nutrients, and methylene blue act in the body. We want to look at lifestyle and sleep and stress levels and hydration and obviously diet and exercise. All of these things can impact the way in which nutrition works with methylene blue. And we want to approach those who decide to take methylene blue uh, from a healthcare perspective as opposed to a disease care perspective. And what I mean by that is we want to make sure that we're monitoring the person's chemistry to make sure that methylene blue is doing what it's doing and it's not causing any adverse effects. We want to know that it's working the way that it should. And the same thing for the nutritional supplements. And as far as the recommended daily allowances, have you heard of those RDAs? Well, the recommended daily allowances are governmental guidelines, which are, which outline the minimum amount of various nutrients that will prevent a deficiency from happening, uh, happening in a person. So I want to say that again, the recommended daily allowances are, are governmental guidelines that outline the minimum amount of a nutrient necessary to prevent deficiency. The RDAs are not optimal amounts for health. So whenever we're approaching any cancer situation, whether we're dealing with methylene blue or anything else, we want to uh, make sure that we are using optimal levels, which may be many times higher than the recommended daily allowances. And many doctors don't understand that because they mistakenly believe that recommended daily allowances, the RDAs, are optimal levels, but they are not. And then it's very important, at least in the way that I approach people as, as a blood detective, is to make sure that when I'm comparing people's laboratory work to see if things are working, I don't simply compare people to clinical ranges, which are the ranges that regular doctors use, you know, for your cholesterol levels and your chloride levels and your uric acid levels, all the different things in your blood. Those are designed to detect disease, but there are different ranges of normal for all the blood tests, which are optimal where you want to be if you want to shoot for the healthiest levels. So whenever I do a blood interpretation uh, for a person, I always compare their labs to the clinical ranges like every physician does, and also to the healthy ranges. And that's what I do as a blood detective.
And as far as the testing that's involved, there are many dozens of different nutritional tests that I feel are necessary to monitor in those taking methylene blue or those with any cancerous uh, situation. And the testing that I do might borrow from a dozen or more different areas of medicine. I may do tests that a gastroenterologist would do and an immunologist would do and a, um, a gynecologist would do. My point though is in regular medicine, doctors tend to remain quite compartmentalized, testing only within their specialty, but that is not holistic care. So I hope that was useful for you. Thank you for joining me for this brief presentation on Methylene Blue. And if you'd like to reach me for a free 15-minute phone conversation, you can call me at 914-552. 1442, and you can send me your show ideas or critiques on any of the topics that I've presented so far and, and in the future at info at blooddetective.com. And finally, on my website, there's lots of free content. Just search the search bar at the top of the page and uh, absolutely look in the podcast section at www.drmichaelwalt.com. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'll see you next time.